Not so far. You can get to a fight away at Ron Borough, come out Chris Nogo. Deal for Gallon, and the person and my head on. Deal, he committed our rat, and Priso Murkanis, and Boy, my master said. Deal, he gave and Borough gave, you know. Deal, he married a theme. Am I going to tell you that I am 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 going it's a very great pleasure and a very great honour to be with you on this occasion and such a delight for all of us in the board to see so many people gathered to share their commitment. It was suggested that I might like to say a few words about the theological basis of Christian A's work and the strategy that we're currently considering. So now is the time to run for the doors. <laughs> but we've given ourselves three governing principles to work with. We're concerned in the future of Christian aid to honor the prophetic voice, to honor and to explore issues around power, its use and misuse, and of course, to address the fundamental question of poverty and how we end it. Poverty, power and prophecy. I'm going to start at the end by saying just a few words about prophecy to begin with. There are two things that the great prophets of ancient Israel seem to be deeply concerned about. Two challenges that they put before God's people. First of all, they challenge idolatry. They tell God's people that they are giving supreme value to the wrong things. They are giving value to their own security, their own prosperity at the expense of others. They are prioritizing that safe place, that comfortable place in the world, at the cost of the needs of the most vulnerable. And in tonight's first lesson, we heard Isaiah's ringing denunciation of that behavior. Isaiah reminding God's people that however much effort they put into the externals of religion, it was going to be futile and worse than futile if they didn't address the basic question of their integrity before God, which consisted in trust, generosity, compassion, and community building. The prophet begins then by addressing this question of idolatry. To fail to attend to the needs of the most vulnerable is itself a kind of idolatry. It's failing to recognize the true God because the true God calls out to us from the heart of vulnerability. The true God calls out to us, not from a position of power and control, but from a position of solidarity with those most deeply in need, most deeply exposed to the suffering and injustice of the world. And if we fail to see God there, in that place of solidarity and suffering, ultimately at the cross, then we are not looking towards the true God. And there's an end of it. We are idolaters. Whatever we say, whatever we do, we are idolaters because we are looking in the wrong place for God. <coughs> Second thing that the prophets say is that God's people, when they fail to reflect God's own utter generosity and solidarity, 
are failing to communicate to the world the gift that they have been given. It's as if they have never received and never understood what it is that God gives them. They might just as well never have received the grace and liberation that God brings. The gift, you might say, has gone dead and stale in their hands. And the call that the prophets make is act in such a way that it looks to the world as if you know you have received a gift. Act towards the world so that it looks as though you have been transformed, been enriched, been enlarged. Don't look at the world, engage with the world, as if your only priority was to safeguard something you've been given, because that means it wasn't a real gift. Share that gift, and you will tell the world what kind of God we're dealing with. Two closely interwoven themes, then, in prophecy. Beware of idolatry. Beware of trying to cling to the gift you've been given. And when you learn to share the gift you've been given, the liberation you've been given, then the true God shines out. Then your light will shine forth, says Isaiah. The glory of the Lord will be our rear guard. Something similar is at work in the New Testament reading also, where St. Paul rather surprisingly defines the long-term goal of the sharing of resources among believers as simply creating gratitude. You act like this so that people will be joyful and grateful. So that people will turn to the source of their being and their life with delight and thanksgiving. So the prophetic role is something we need to think through very carefully in those terms as it affects us today. Words like prophet and prophecy are flung around quite a lot, and sometimes it just seems as if it's a word for talking very loudly about what you believe, or banging a particular kind of drum, or being a general nuisance. But prophecy in scripture is something much tighter and tougher and more joyful. Prophecy in scripture is this joyful courageous witness to the gift that's been given, and the joyful and courageous refusal of all other imitation gods that are around, especially the god of our own security and our own prosperity. <coughs> but if we are going to live prophetically, if we're going to live out of that vision, we have to ask ourselves each day about the use of our power. So easy to hear the words of Isaiah and others at a superficial level and to think, yes, that's quite right. Now I must do something for those poor people. And from the great height of our security and our prosperity, we drop a few crumbs to be helpful. What we don't do, as a rule, is to take risks alongside those who live with risk. And above all, what we don't do is to open our hands to receive the gifts that others can give us. <coughs> our sense of power as something we own and manage and distribute around the world and use to help those mysterious others far away, that's got to give way to a sense that in our relationship with one another, in the friendships and links that we build, we are all of us enriched and we are all of us empowered. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was reading an essay from the 1930s by one of the really great figures of the mid-century on the continent of Europe. Not a very well-known figure, but a giant nonetheless. A Russian nun who lived in Paris and ended her life in the concentration camp of the Ravensbrück murdered by the Nazis because of her work with Jewish refugees in Paris. And she wrote in 1937, I think, an essay about 
the second great commandment, love of neighbour. Many great things in that essay, but one thing that I remember is that she says, the person who thinks that they're being worldly, realistic, practical, pragmatic, is actually the person who is least in touch with reality. Because they think they can secure themselves, their power, their influence, their control, <coughs> independently of relation with, mutual relation with the other. Real worldliness is being alongside one another. The real world is not, as we're sometimes led to believe, the world of selfish calculation. The real world is the world of communion, of solidarity and generosity. But to get to the understanding of that, and the making of that real, there's quite a lot of letting go that has to go on. Letting go of our own sense of power and patronage. And that's why, in Christian aid, we have always been, and are more than ever now, committed to the model of partnership. Committed to not going into circumstances elsewhere in the world and saying, so to speak, I know what you need. But going, sitting, listening, and learning. In that learning, we not only discover what the most effective support is that we can give, we also discover something of ourselves, something of what we need from the witness and generosity of the people we work alongside. Working in partnership, as everyone will tell you, is a risky and complicated business, and Christian Aid has every reason to know that. But it's a risk we believe to be worth taking, because only in this way can we truly say with conviction and expect to be believed that we are not in the business of providing help from on high. There is only one who brings help from on high, and it's not us. So we seek to build togetherness mutuality, listening to one another, working with the grain of other people's reality. And that means, coming to the third point, that we recognize poverty is ours as well. Our refusals of communion and community, our refusal to stand in solidarity, all these things make us poor deeply needy, hungry for relationship. We may not know it, but that's the truth about ourselves. The poverty of our Western and North Atlantic world these days is a poverty of relationship. And that poverty of relationship shows itself in so many ways in our public language and our politics. The poverty of relationship which is unable to see how deeply we need one another, and how deeply we need to find the goals that we can share. In this nation, in the United Kingdom, in the whole world, there's the challenge. Only when we begin to see our poverty of relation can we begin truthfully and effectively to address other sorts of poverty. Only then, does that become a genuinely mutual matter? So we think about prophecy and power and poverty and how our transformation is part of this. Back to my Russian nun again, Mother Maria Skotsova, who says that the second commandment, loving the neighbor, is not an optional extra, a duty we perform when we've sorted out the really important things. Loving God, the true and living God, yeah. is intrinsically connected with loving the neighbour. And loving the neighbour as oneself means, of course, building real mutuality and asking, what have I to receive as well as what have I to give? We've heard already from Leonard something of the history of this country history we can be very proud of, that deep internationalist vision which has so characterised so much of Welsh politics 
in the last couple of hundred years. And it's no accident, I think, that one of the most innovative and significant experiments that Wales has made is indeed Dolan Cymru. Wales linked, joined with another country. Not as a white saviour, as they say, from elsewhere, but as a partner. That's a vision which I know still matters a great deal to the government of Wales. And that's why I know we will all welcome deeply at the end what you had to say about the partnership we might work for with the government here. But our new strategy, which you'll hear a bit more about, is a serious attempt to think through the implications of this in terms of what kind of institution, what kind of organisation Christian aid is and could be. How do we genuinely, practically work in such a way that we show these commitments? How do we build a kind of organisation which truly listens, truly shares power and leverage? We have to discuss this and think it through at a time when there are many, many pressures on Christian aid, financially, in other ways. There are difficult decisions, costly decisions ahead. And yet, we're taking those and approaching them in confidence that the basic principle, the basic commitment of partnership remains all important because only so, we believe, can we serve the true God rather than serving some idol of a successful northern NGO distributing largesse to the poor of the world somewhere else, capital S, capital E. So in conclusion, my hope and prayer for Christian aid here in Wales and for Christian aid internationally is that we go on speaking and living prophetically, challenging in our lives and in our actions and what we say, all those things which push us subtly but very steadily back towards a false god, an isolated model of security, a refusal of communion. My hope and my prayer is that we'll understand that we, as Christian aid, are in this country of ours UK and in the world, we are there in significant part to witness to the poverty of relationship that affects this so-called developed world, to offer other models and other hopes, and in so doing, to open the way to a deeper, richer and more joyful vision of the Kingdom of God. Gracias.